In 1992, two games were released based on the Dune franchise. These were Dune and Dune 2, the latter of which went on to change the face of PC gaming forever. In Dune 2, you collect resources, build bases, train units, select them and destroy the enemy base. In essence, Dune 2 was an RTS. The first RTS to be exact. Sure, we've had games like Herzog's Wife for the Mega Drive and Stonkers for the ZX Spectrum before, but this is where the RTS formula as we know it was created. Without Dune 2, we wouldn't have had titles like Command and Conquer, Age of Empires, Warcraft or Starcraft. But this video isn't about Dune 2. This video is about its predecessor. This video is about a game whose only major flaw was launching in the same year as its more popular sequel. This video is about the forgotten masterpiece known as Dune. Launched in 1992, Dune is unlike any other game that came before it or since. While its sequels were always traditional RTS games, the first Dune game was an interesting mix of a point-and-click adventure game with that of a grand strategy title. And I'd argue, this is the only time I've ever seen these two genres mixed in such a way. But perhaps I'm getting ahead of myself. Dune was launched in 1992 and was the first video game adaptation of not just the book, but also the movie of the same name. In fact, every Dune game released by Virgin Interactive or Westwood is based on the movie rather than the book. An interesting story about Dune is that Virgin Interactive reached out to Cryo Interactive to make this game. But halfway through development, Virgin decided to cancel the game and acquired the services of Westwood Studios instead. As it turns out, Cryo Interactive refused this and continued working on the game without Virgin's consent. As a result, one of Virgin's higher-ups flew all the way to France to demand that they stop all production on Dune. And reportedly, the game's director, Rémy Herbelot, replied, If you weren't such an idiot, you'd first take a look at our game and then decide on whether or not you should cancel it. But apparently, this bout of badassery worked, because Virgin was so impressed by the game that they decided to continue funding its development. So Cryo created Dune and Westwood's project became Dune 2. All of this was told in an interview French YouTuber Benzai did with Rémy Herbulot around 2008. But sadly, the website that hosted the video interview is gone and as a result, the full details of the interview have been lost to time. Man, what a studio as badass as this one, surely they have some great games under their belt, right? Yeah, truth be told, Cryo Interactive is actually seen as something of a joke now. This studio folded back in 2002, but their efforts had dipped in quality long before then. Releasing that terrible Hellboy game for the PS1 and the terrible but weirdly fetishistic Pax Corpus, which actually began development as an Aeon Flux title. In fact, many people seem to think that Dune was not just their masterpiece but their only good game. I disagree with this sentiment, as I feel Lost Eden was another great game that did not quite reach the heights of Dune. 
The story of Dune takes place several millennia in the future where space travel is possible thanks to a substance known as the Spice Melange. This spice is a vital ingredient for space travel and without it, planets and civilizations would become isolated from each other. The problem is that the spice can only be found on one planet in the entire universe, Arrakis, better known as Dune. You play as the young, 16-year-old nobleman Paul Atreides, son of Duke Leto Atreides, and you're sent to Dune to oversee the spice mining efforts for the Emperor. The problem is that a core of the planet is already taken by a rival noble lineage, the Harkonnen. From here on, you're free to explore the planet at your own will. And yes, I do mean the planet. I mean... You can't simply walk to a location, as the sun will get to you and cause your character to pass out. Instead, you'll have to fly there. Your main method of transportation is the Ornithopter, and you can fly anywhere you want in the planet, provided you don't fly over lands controlled by the enemy faction. And each piece of land in the game is a real location on the world, but I'll get to that. So. What makes this game so special? Well, there are several factors, but we'll start with the gameplay. As I said, this game mixes point-and-click adventure game with grand strategy. So what this means is, you can roam around the world as you want, but your objective is to visit the many sieges around Dune and find the various leaders of the native Fremen population. You're then tasked with getting them to join your cause against the Harkonnen and manage your growing armies. And this is what I find so fascinating about Dune. Yes, it's a strategy game, like so many others that came before or after. But the fact that you're also an individual that can visit each location in the world, friendly or otherwise, creates a really unique dynamic. I mean, you can see how your actions influence the world and even visit enemy locations by yourself to sabotage their fortresses. Each Fremen unit can contain anywhere between 400 to just over 2000 men, and you can assign them one of three jobs. The first is spice mining, which is the basis of your economy. Spice is required to send weekly payments to the Emperor, which increases with each passing week. Thankfully, you can negotiate to send either more or less than what he's asking, in return for more or less time until your next payment. Because of this, it's usually a good idea to maximize spice production. And you can do this by viewing which locations are richer in spice and sending troops with the most men, while other factors, like their motivation and experience, will also influence spice production. Yes, no matter which job you select for your units, they can level up in that specific task, improving their output. Some sieges will also have abandoned gear you can use, or you can discover villages and buy gear for your troops like spice harvesters, which increase spice production, and ornithopters, which reduce travel time between locations, while also preventing sandworm attacks. Additionally, it's just really cool visiting a location and seeing the spice harvesters toiling away or your fleet of ornithopters at the ready depending on how many you have at your disposal. Alternatively, you can have your units trained in the art of war, though it's a good idea to give them some time to train before deploying them to battle. This is one aspect where the point-and-click mechanics come in handy, as one of the characters you meet in the game will greatly speed up their training provided they're in the same location. Other characters will increase the morale of your units once you meet them or satisfy certain conditions. And again, just like with spice harvesting, it's a good idea to either buy or steal some equipment for your men, including Chris knives, laser guns, welding modules, or even atomic weaponry. Military units can also be used to spy on enemy locations. 
by discovering where they are located, whether or not there are enemy forces present, how well armed or trained they are, and if they have any prisoners you can rescue. Finally, you can train them in ecology. And this is a really interesting one, as it's the only way to unlock the pacifist route. Basically, you can use ecologist teams to build wind traps on siege locations, which will create water. Then, once you have enough water, you can start planting vegetation in each location, which will then spread upwards across the planet so long as you have enough water for it. Creating vegetation will eliminate all spice in any area it touches. But on the other hand, it will greatly increase the morale of all your troops, while also driving away all Harkonnen units from their locations once they realize they can't mine spies from that location anymore. But what makes this game so interesting is how Grand Strategy and Point and Click Adventure come together in an elegant package. As I mentioned before, you can travel anywhere across the planet, and each pixel on the world map is a real spot on the game, meaning it will display dunes or rocks as you fly over them, but they'll also start displaying all the vegetation you planted. In fact, I'm fairly certain that at one point, the developers had intended for the player to be able to walk to each location without the use of an orny, not just because each pixel location on the map is a real spot that visually changes with the world itself, but also because your location on the world map will also shift as you start walking. But I'm guessing they realized the risk of getting lost was too great, so they made it impossible for you to walk more than a few dozen steps. Additionally, it's really cool visiting all these interesting locations, like the Fremen sieges, the villages, or my personal favorite, spying on an enemy fortress while their units are away. When you do this, you can rescue captured NPCs you might have had on your party and even find Fremen slaves who you can free and rally to your cause. And if you visit the enemy locations by riding a sandworm, yes, you can ride giant sandworms in this game, which is freaking awesome, you can then get away by stealing one of their ornies and giving it to your Fremen. It's free real estate. The game is very light on puzzles, as they always depend on you meeting someone, talking to someone at the right time, or taking them along with you for various reasons. Though like I said, they connect rather nicely with the grand strategy segments. Like for example, Gurney Halleck will speed up the military training speed for your units, or Shani, who heals sick units and Duncan Idaho, who manages your finances, invoices and payments to either the Emperor or smugglers. Most games would have had these character advisors as selectable options within a menu, but in Dune, they're all real people. Real people who, if you're not careful, you can lose in this world. People who can get captured by the Harkonnen and most importantly, people whom you can have conversations with outside of work. It's these tiny little details which help enrich the world of Dune. In Dune 2, ordering something from smugglers is all done through a few clicks on a menu, and characters only speak to give you the mission briefing. But in this game, there are no missions, and with the exception of the world map, there are no menus, it's all one giant campaign, and so many decisions are made through dialogue, making everything feel much more natural. It's also the first game I remember playing that had an actual love scene that wasn't played for laughs. Up to this point, love scenes in games were usually played for humor like in Leisure Suit Larry or Star Control 2, but Dune plays it straight. And although the scene comes rather abruptly, it was really cool for the time. In fact, in the early stages of the game, you cannot contact units at a distance. You have to literally travel to your troops' locations and tell them what you want them to do. 
it's not until later that you unlock the ability to contact your units at a distance. It also does a really good job at conveying the passage of time. You see, there are no turns in Dune. Everything is done and tracked in real time. This means that if you're traveling from point A to point B, you can see the sun setting, giving way to night. And if you wait some more, you'll then witness a sunrise. Now granted, you can just skip your destination, so you're not stuck in this travel screen. But the point is, time is constantly flowing as you play the game. If you stand still and do nothing for a few minutes, time will keep passing. I also absolutely love the game's sound, or rather, its music. Yet, yeah, you might have noticed you're not hearing any sound effects in this video. And that's because the game doesn't have any. Ok, that's not true. It has about 3 or 4 sound effects. But when you're playing the original PC release, for the most part, it's just you and the music. But this actually works in the game's favor, because the music is incredibly unique, ranging from light techno to tribalistic music, providing you with a real sense of immersion. In fact, the music was so good that a full remastered audio soundtrack was released in that very same year. It's quite hard to find it now. And I remember reading an interview in the early 2000s where the composer himself urged people to just pirate the CD. Though again, I can't seem to find this interview anymore. And finally, can we just talk about the graphics? I'm sorry, but this is some of the best pixel art I've ever seen. Remember, this game came out in 1992. The 16-bit wars had just begun. And yet, look at all this detail. And look at these amazing backgrounds. There's so many of them which are comic book worthy. Maybe even more than that. And this game ran on fairly low spec computers. I mean, I had a 386 IBM PC at the time, meaning the technology was about 5 years old at that point. And the game ran perfectly for me. And I quite like all these tiny little details in the game. Like how your eyes become bluer as you progress through the game. Which is a plot point in the books and the movie. Or how they achieve this neat water reflection effect with the game's pixel art. One common complaint I see levied at this game is the art style, particularly regarding the characters' faces. Which, yes, they can look very unique, but I feel this criticism is unwarranted. Like I mentioned before, Cryo Interactive is a French studio, and I believe most people aren't aware of how artistic and unique the French sci-fi scene was during the 80s and 90s. Just like how we tend to associate Japan with a vast collection of differing art styles that we collectively refer to as anime, so too did the French innovate in their own way. This is the nation responsible for comic books like Valerian and Laureline, Metal Hurlin, which would be known internationally as Heavy Metal Magazine, and of course, any movie done by René Lalou. So is it any wonder that the same country that created this, this, or this would also come up with these designs? If anything, I'm quite sad that France's unique artistic vision for sci-fi did not achieve the same levels of commercial success anime did. An example of this can be seen in the original designs for Paul Trades and Fedrauta Harkonnen which had much more unique designs before Virgin asked Cryo to redraw them to more closely resemble Kyle McLaughlin and Sting. Now, 
this game does have some flaws which hold it back from being perfect. The first is the fact that the original floppy disk version of MS-DOS has a few game-breaking bugs if you try to hold off on doing certain story segments. Secondly, the game is too easy for its own good. Simply put, the Harkonnen are not very aggressive. For example, they'll never attack or expand into neutral territories. Instead, they'll only attack your lands. And even then, they'll only attack lands which have units in place. So that makes it easy to predict how they're going to behave and plan accordingly. Because of this, I really wish this game had difficulty settings. Finally, the game was brought over to the Amiga and Sega CD, and it also received an enhanced MS-DOS CD port. Sadly, it's very easy to tell that this game was created with MS-DOS machines in mind, because the art style took a huge hit when converting this game to either the Amiga or Sega CD. The backgrounds look a lot darker with very little attention being given to how they were recolored, and the character portraits didn't fare much better. The best example I can think of is the character Hera, which looks like this in the original version. But she was changed so much in the Amiga and Sega CD ports that she doesn't even look human anymore, despite being a Fremen, and the Fremen are human. I also don't really care for the changes that the CD versions brought about. Whether it's the MS-DOS CD version or the Sega CD port, many of the backgrounds were redrawn with an early 3D modeling mindset, but I generally find that they don't look as visually interesting as the attractive pixel art from the original. Moreover, now, when traveling, you're essentially stuck watching the same FMV scene over and over again. The original version wasn't that much different in terms of concept, but I do prefer that one over this pre-recorded FMV. Voice acting was also added to the CD ports, and though it's not good voice acting in the traditional sense, I quite enjoy it. The way the actors deliver their lines somehow ends up fitting the dreamlike atmosphere Dune provides. I was born here and loved this planet. Have you seen the desert at night? It's so beautiful. Regardless, my preferred method of playing Dune is still the original release, and that's the one I recommend. As you can likely tell, I have a deep appreciation for Dune. I can think of no game like this that has ever come before or since. The closest parallels I can draw are a few Japanese visual novels with strategy elements, but nothing quite captures the mystical and dreamlike mood of the original Dune game. For years, I have waited for some studio or indie developer to take Dune's formula and evolve it further, but sadly, this never happened. I love the Dune series of video games, and I can't overstate how important Dune 2 was to PC gaming. But the RTS genre has evolved so much over the years that playing Dune 2 now feels archaic. But the original game, the first Dune, that game is timeless, unsullied by competition or age, and is as unique now as it was when it first launched. Hey everyone, thank you for watching Stika's Retro Corner. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell and share this video. All that fun social media stuff. And you can also support me on Patreon. It may not seem like it, but even one dollar is a really big help in keeping this channel going. Anyway, I hope you have a great day. Bye!